What mistakes have you seen、uh, B two B companies make when they come to markets abroad, such as the Chinese market? Well, there are many,、um, but I'm gonna just try to narrow it down to the most common ones. All right. So we'll start with a very obvious one, which is the language barrier.、Right? Mm-hmm. The language barrier, and coupled with that, the cultural barrier. Because as you know, Chinese is an extremely、uh, complex language. It's completely different from what we know in the West with our Indo-European languages. Because mostly in Europe, you have Latin as the base, right? But when you go to China as a Westerner, you have nothing as the base. You have to start from zero. It's a very complex language, but it also is a language that has profound meaning with several layers of complexity, right? And if you don't understand that, and、uh, you rely on, say, for example, AI to just do translation, right? You're going to get into a lot of trouble. Short of stating the obvious, the、mm-hmm. second barrier is the lack of understanding of cultural differences.、Um, that in itself, I think,、uh, just requires a separate podcast episode. But I'm going to try to summarize it into one sentence. Mm-hmm. Uh, Chinese society and many Asian societies, for that ma- matter, are based on hierarchy that are not observed or practiced in the West. The other one is also the concept of face, which which exists on a on a different level in the West, but in in most Asian societies, it's a really big deal. And what does that basically mean? The gaining of face, the losing of face, and the saving of face. It's like doing things. In the presence of others that make them look bad, for example, that's losing face.、Mm. Giving credit to the team in front of the big boss—that's giving them face, right? So it's all, all, all these like you know little like they're, they're like these cultural nuances, right? That Westerners, if they don't do their homework, they go into a market like China and they're unaware of that. Okay, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Marketing Tales with Chris Raposa. Today, I'm happy to introduce you to my guest, Christian Klepp. He's the co-founder and director of client engagement at Einblick Consulting. Welcome, Christian. Hi, Chris, and、uh, thank you. It's a、uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. So、uh, we've we've talked before. So we're kind of getting friendly with each other and knowing a little bit、yeah. about our our personal backgrounds and、um, I've I really realized you, that you have an interesting background and、uh, and I know that you grew up in Asia and then、mm-hmm. decided to go to the university、um, the management development institute、uh, of business in Singapore of all places、mm-hmm. uh, and you also speak German、uh, with an Austrian background so、uh, yes. What made you move to Singapore for your education, and why did you study there? Yeah. Okay. Well, first of all,、uh, thanks for the opportunity to、uh, be on your show.、Uh, secondly, like yes, I think、uh, interesting background is probably the easiest way to describe it. <laughs>、um, I was born in Austria, and I grew up in the Philippines, which is in Southeast Asia.、Uh, but I grew up there speaking German at home,、mm. right? And so it's a it's a little bit of a Multicultural background there, and I think I was very、uh, fortunate、uh, to grow up in a、uh, in an environment that was multilingual,、uh, multicultural as well. So actually, it wasn't it wasn't my idea initially. It was my parents that encouraged me to go and study in Singapore, and they they encouraged me simply because they wanted me to have a better education, which I think every every parent aspires to do that, right? Give give their children a better education.、Uh, And、uh, also to learn about, most importantly, also to learn about what made Singapore such a success story.、Mm. And hopefully, I can take those lessons and、um, apply them to my my personal and professional career. And、uh, I think one of the, one of the many things、uh, I, I I think I actually learned a lot of things while living there. Right.、Um, I, I mean, I was reading my degree in、uh, business management studies at、uh, MDIS, as you just mentioned, and I was also starting to learn Mandarin Chinese because. For some interesting reason, even back in the late '90s, I kind of felt, at some point down the road, learning Chinese would、uh, serve me well. <laughs> Case in point,、uh, what I was just telling you about my client this morning, where I had to communicate with them in Mandarin, right?、Mm-hmm. But back to my point was one of a couple of the things that I took away from my education there, which have really served me well in my career,、um, is, and this isn't by no means a small feat, but 
being disciplined in everything that you do. Mm. Having a sense of urgency that if you can do something today, do not put it off for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And one thing that they kept um, driving home in Singapore, regardless of whether that was in university or to the society in general, they encouraged continuous learning, continuous improvement, regardless of your age, right? Because you have to be, you have to continue because, you know, Singapore is a small country and they don't have any natural resources, but they have one important resource, their people, right? Mm -hmm. So their people always have to be on par. They always have to have the relevant skills to address the challenges of whatever economic climate um, the country is facing, right? So continuous learning, um, thinking and planning ahead. Um, and this is something they kept saying in university, complacency kills, do not be complacent. Just because you achieved the high mark in this quarter, that means you can't, that doesn't mean you can sit back and relax and then not worry about the next quarter and so on and so forth, right? And there will always be problems. And I think that was the most important takeaway for me um, during my years in Singapore. There will always be problems, but you have to learn to view the problem from different angles in order to come up with the right solution. Mm. And I thought that was very profound. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very profound. Great mindset too. And uh, no, no one there is so successful in, in Singapore as a city state. Yes. Um, okay. Going back to your uh, upbringing um, and your German background and the German na na native language skills. Um, yeah. So upon graduation from uh, from um, the school MDIS in Singapore, you started your marketing yeah. career at a company in Germany of all places. Yeah. But then you moved back to China where you held various marketing and business leadership positions. Um, did you know early on that you wanted to get into marketing while you studied at MDIS? I did, and it was really during my university days that um, I started to uh, develop this interest in marketing, and I'll tell you why. Um, it was out of all the courses, and I'm not saying that all the other fields are bad. It's, it was just the one that appealed to me, right? But marketing for me was the field that opened up this opportunity for you to use the left and right side of your brain. It's mm -hmm. like you can marry different disciplines into one. And what do I mean by that? You can you can combine analytical and logical with creative and emotional, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So, and that for me was something that uh, marketing uh, offered and that was something that really appealed to me. Um, I also tend to be by nature a structured person. And as an ex-colleague of mine who was British used to say, Christian, if I didn't know any better, I'd reckon you'd be you're a fan of order, right? <laughs> <laughs> because I love putting everything into charts. Mm -hmm. I love to have diagrams. I, I I diagrammed everything. Every time there was a problem in the company or with the team, I would diagram it out, right? And for some interesting reason, that appealed to me. And you know, in marketing, there are so many situations and opportunities for you to be able to do that, mm -hmm. right? So. I mean, to, to cut the long story short, I mean, of course, it's it's developed uh, since my university days, right? There's more digitization, there's more technology. But just imagine, like, think about your own work, Chris, mm -hmm. right? It's not just all creativity. You've got to put everything into structured formats. How do you plan your campaigns? How do you plan your content? When do you push your content out? Right? Exactly. Uh, exactly. How is your content working? How do you determine if it's working or not, right? So there's a combination of the logical and the analytical, but with the creative as, as well. Because as you well know, you can be as logical and analytical if you want, but if your content is not creative or innovative, it will be ignored. Mm -hmm. That's right. Absolutely. It's a great point. It's a great point to write it out. So because it, then you can also refer back to it in the in the, in the the future to see what worked yes. and what didn't work. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's great. And then, um, you know, you, you like I mentioned, you had quite a career in, China, but then you moved uh, across the pond to um, Toronto, Canada, yes. to start your own company, Imbly Consultant. Um, real quick, in a sixty seconds or less, what does Imbly <laughs> stand for, and what do you offer? Yeah, yeah, uh, across a very large pond, I might add. Right? <laughs> but uh, Imbly is the uh, the German word, as you know, for insight, and right, and that's that's what we hope to deliver for customers in the B two B tech and professional services space, right? And how do we 
what do we hope to achieve with that? It's like insights that help them to differentiate themselves in a competitive market and help them to generate more sales from their niche. And mm -hmm. we do that through market research, brand strategy, and copywriting content development. Okay, very mm -hmm. good. And then um, doing a little bit of research on I'm Blake as well as following mm -hmm. you on LinkedIn and also being a part of your podcast that you have. Thanks for mm -hmm. having me on, by the way. Um, a challenge you solve uh, our communication bows. Um, one of the slogans that you have on your website is, if you try to please everyone, you'll end up pleasing no one. So oh, yeah. how important is concise messaging and focusing on a niche market in B2B marketing? Yeah, great question. And one of the reasons why I put that on the website is because I've seen that live, right? I've seen the chaos unfold <laughs> in real life. And that's that's why I made it one of my missions, a B2B, B2B marketer on a mission, right? to help fix these communications walls. But back to your question, you know, there's a couple of things that you need to um, unpack here, right? So one of, this, one of them, I think, which is fairly obvious is that we need to realize as B2B marketers, regardless of what company we find ourselves in, big or small, there are always going to be constraints to budget, resources, bandwidth, et cetera, right? And let's face it, right? In, especially in B2B, the products and services that you offer are not something that everybody will buy. So the messaging should not be for everybody. The mm -hmm. messaging should be for a specific niche and a specific segment. And I will go even one step further or go even deeper, right? And uh, you probably know where I'm going with this because we had a conversation about it. In B2B, especially when it comes to marketing, when it comes to crafting messages, we're not talking about one target persona or one target audience. We're talking about multiple groups, right? Mm -hmm. Because more often than not, in B2B, we're talking about a B2B buying committee or buying group. I mean, call them what you want, right? But basically, you're talking about a group of people who are responsible for making a decision about whether to use the product or service of a certain provider or not. And mm -hmm. each of these people are in different roles and functions in the organization. They all have different motivations. They all have different preferences. They all have different sets of challenges. Some of them are common, right? They all, have, they, they all have common mandates or common goals to me, but they also have individual ones. Um, case in point, the procurement person might have different motivations from an HR person, from a finance person, from a tech person, so on and so forth. So if you make the message too generic, you'll have this guessing game of like, okay, are they talking to me or are they talking to somebody else, right? But yeah. if you hone that down to specifically, like, say, a procurement person or an HR person, right, the chances, I mean, it's not, of course, it's never really a done deal, but the probability of you appealing to that group is much higher. Mm -hmm. So that was a long story to get to the point, but um, that's the reason why it's important to niche down. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right? And you you previously mentioned early in our in our chat that you just spoke to a client um, um, from China. Yeah. Talking about messaging, how do you determine brand strategies when entering international markets? What's important there? Oof. Okay. <clears throat> so let me just say that that's a question that you cannot answer in one sentence. <laughs> let's put it that way. But if we're going to, I mean, let's let's focus on maybe let's say China, for example, right? Because I think the first thing that you have to determine when you say international markets, you have to answer the question, okay, which market are we talking about? Because mm -hmm. as you know, different markets will have varying levels of maturity. And when I mean maturity, it can mean like the market as a whole, right? So for example, you cannot compare apples to apples. Like you cannot compare say Japan to Cambodia because Japan has mm -hmm. a much more developed and mature economy. So that, you you know, you start with that and then you look at like, okay, so like what I've done in China, for example, is you determine, okay, so how long has that specific B2B company had a presence in that market? Mm -hmm. Look at their past successes or failures, what worked and didn't. And it's interesting also, one of the things that uh, we used to do is not just look at their marketing campaigns, but look at their sales initiatives as well, because believe it or not, they they need to be working together, right? It has to function like a like a like an ecosystem right like a like a well-oiled machine right mm -hmm. so look at what worked and what didn't and why right target audience analysis and review the buyer's journey to see what's changed because 
And I saw this over and over again in China, right? Foreign companies, and regardless of where they were from, right? Foreign companies would come in and, oh, this is the hottest selling product that we have in the United States or in, in the EU. And uh, it drives me crazy when people say, oh, it's the EU, so they cluster everything into one market. But you, you and I both know that the EU in, in itself is such a diverse place, right? Mm -hmm. So to be able to say that and say, well, surely this will work in China. I'm like, well, do you understand how the Chinese customer buys, mm -hmm. how they search for information? Because it's not the same as the customers in other markets, right? So that's one thing that you need to understand, right? Look at the competitive ecosystem because the competitors, I can, you know, I can bet you a hundred bucks that the, the competitors are are not the same, right? Mm -hmm. Review the company's goals and objectives in that market because they will be different, right? Again, it goes back to the level of maturity of the market and the company's presence in that market, right? Yeah, they yep. will be different. And yep. after that, after after all of these, after we've done our homework and reviewed and analyzed all of these factors, then we come up with a localized brand strategy of which messaging is just one component. Right? Yeah, totally. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, staying in China and the Chinese market because they have, yep. a, they have a background in there. What mistakes have you seen uh, B2B companies make when they come to markets abroad, such as the Chinese market? What's a mistake? <laughs> I, I, I think I will answer that question with another question. How much time do you have? <laughs> Um, I will try to be as succinct as possible. There are many, um, but I'm going to just try to narrow it down to the most common ones. All right. So we'll start with a very obvious one, which is the language barrier, mm -hmm. right? the language barrier and coupled with that, the cultural barrier, because as you know, Chinese is an extremely uh, complex language. It's completely different from what we know in the West with our Indo-European languages, because mostly in Europe, you have Latin as the base, right? But when you go to China, as a Westerner, you have nothing as the base. You have to start from zero, right? It's a very complex language, but it also is a language that has profound meaning with several layers of complexity, right? Mm -hmm. And if you don't understand that, and uh, you rely on, say, for example, AI to just do translation, right? You're going to get into a lot of trouble, short of say being the obvious. The mm -hmm. second barrier is the lack of understanding of cultural differences. Um, that in itself, I think, uh, just requires a separate podcast episode, but I'm going to try to summarize it into one sentence. Mm -hmm. uh, Chinese society and many Asian societies, for that ma matter, are based on hierarchy, right? So there's different levels of hierarchy right? that, uh, that are not observed or practiced in the West. I'm just going to say that uh, that's a very like politically correct way to say it. <laughs> yeah. The other one is also the concept of face, which which exists on a, on a different level in the West, but in, in most Asian societies, it's a really big deal. And what does that basically mean? The gaining of face, the losing of face and the saving of face. It's like doing things in the presence of others that make them look bad, for example. That's losing face. Mm. Giving credit to the team in front of the big boss, that's giving them face, right? So it's all, all, all these like, you know, little like, they're, they're like these cultural nuances, right? That Westerners, if they don't do their homework, they go into a market like China and they're unaware of that, right? Mm. Um, also, I think there's a profound lack of understanding of China as a country because I've seen companies treat China as one market. And I would argue that you need to treat it as different markets within a single country. Why? Because China has different levels, again, of maturity and development based on the geographic region, mm -hmm. right? So the, obviously the, the big cities like uh, Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, right? So all these, uh, all these cities are all mostly on the Eastern part along the coast. And the further west you go, it's it's uh, still under development, right? The other thing in China, which I think the Western media does a very good job of talking about, is censorship, right? Yeah. There's uh, very strict gov government regulations, but I'm not going to get into that. But just just to say, yeah, that's one that's one impediment, obviously, right? Um, not being adaptable or flexible uh, to China's speed. Uh, what do I mean by that? Um, let's just say. I'll give you a very simple example. 
and I'm not even exaggerating. Sometimes as from the agency perspective, if we went into to a client briefing, sometimes they would call us in on a Thursday or Friday afternoon at 5 p.m. and they give us the briefing and they say we need the uh, proposal by Monday morning at nine. So essentially you're given two and a half days to work on a proposal. Mm -hmm. In the West, people would think you're absolutely out of your mind and they'd say, they'd say no way, right? But in China, that was the norm. Interesting. Right. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Interesting. <clears throat> yeah, I've I've noticed the cultural differences is even uh, coming from Germany to the United States. Yeah. That, you know, in Germany, if you address your boss with Mister or Mrs. and the last name, and here you call everybody by the first name. Oh yeah. yeah. So yeah, yeah. it's a, it, even there. Absolutely. It's a hierarchical uh, culture, and that's different than here. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And one of the things, for example, it tends to be, I mean, it, it it's gotten better, but like back when I first started out in China, very few people within organizations actually spoke English. Mm -hmm. And most of the decision makers, the very senior people did not. But there were times where I would deal with the foreign companies who had clients on the ground, and they would be dealing with the only English speaker, and they just didn't realize that this person was actually not the decision maker. This person was just the individual that was doing the interpretation, right? But most likely didn't have any decision making authority, which yeah. which uh, resulted in, in in longer lead times, right? Because there was a lot of um, translation going on back and forth. Mm -hmm. right? mm. And uh, staying on the cultural differences, yep. um, during my study at UF, I've learned about the Hofstede cultural dimension test, um, mm -hmm. and you may be familiar with it. Um, yes. Let's say you're trying to introduce a product to the Chinese market. How do you make sure that your messaging is culturally acceptable and does not alienate your audience? Would you hire local talent or would you try to study it and then move over to that uh, to that market? Great question. Uh, once again, similar to the other question, uh, not uh, one that is very easy to answer because uh, I would say that it really depends on a lot of factors it depends on it depends on the product it depends on the industry it depends on again the level of maturity of the market it um the level the 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 length of time that that company has had a presence in the market all of these things matter you, you notice that i keep saying how long they've had a presence in the market how long i've had a presence in the market and Let, let's say why, they why, have why, no presence yeah. let's say they have no presence yeah. they're coming in and yeah. let's say they're coming into the market, they're mm -hmm. trying to explore the market, and let's say they, they try to explore the Eastern market that is more developed yeah. with yeah. the big cities. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, let's get one thing straight. And um, I'm generalizing a little bit here, but it tends to be true to varying uh, degrees. A lot of business in China is done through relationships. Mm. And relationships are cultivated over time. And this is the reason why I keep bringing up the length of time that a company has been present in that market mm -hmm. does it mean that does it mean that newcomers have no chance at all no of, of course not but it does add a, it uh, does add a layer of complexity it does add another challenge but to answer your question just so yes i've i've used um Hofstede, uh, i'm just going to say it the german way the Hofstede test in the past and i do think it's helpful i mean like in, in fact I, I i tried it out just before this call so it's of course it's important to know things, and I and I think that the results for China were accurate. So they were saying things like the power distance is high, absolutely. Individualism is low. I think that tends to be true for most Asian societies. Right? It's very it's more collective and not individualistic. Mm -hmm. right? um, masculinity is high, yes, big surprise. Uncertainty avoidance is low, yes. Long orientation is high, and indulgence is low. But to answer your question, I think we have to take a step back here about launching a product. And I think one thing that I've noticed from my own professional experience and something I've always encouraged people to do is whether it's China or any other market where English is not the official language, I would highly encourage people to learn the local language. And I know that it's not always easy and some languages are easier to learn than others. Like for instance, I would say Spanish is much easier to learn than like Chinese, for instance. But I would highly encourage people like, for example, that have moved to China to work there to make an effort to learn the language. Why? Because from my own experience, 
And I'm the first one that will come clean and say that my, my Mandarin is far from perfect. But when I got it up to a level where I was able to have a conversation with people and understand what was going on, it opened a lot of doors mm -hmm. into the psyche of people, into what the customers were thinking, what they were looking for, what their motivations were. Because one of the things that I did, and yes, marketers do, do need to do this, I went out into the field with the salespeople to have meetings with their customers. And I listened to the uh, the questions that the customers were asking, how the salespeople are addressing them, but also what the challenges were. Because we, I, I did attend meetings where there was a lot of pushback. Mm -hmm. Our clients were not happy about a certain situation. And I listened to the way that the, the sales would um, address those, those, those things, right? Mm -hmm. So where am I, what am I getting at here? It's collecting all these insights about the language, but also the culture and the mindset. And you, you take all these insights back and now that you have them, okay, so what is the recommendation moving forward, right? Well, how do we package this product that will appeal to the target audience in this market, right? Because not all products are going to be sold or received the same way. Mm -hmm. For example, what you know, what, what's a best hit in the United States might not sell at all in a in a market like China. Yeah. Or in Germany. Right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's uh, uh sorry. So just um so taking those insights, coming up with the 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 product packaging and approach, but also very important for a market like China is coming up with a Chinese name for the product, right? And doing testing on that language test. Right to see that it resonates, language check, censorship check, dialect check, and how do you do that? You do we we we've, we've done it through a, a couple of ways. So surveys, and mm -hmm. focus groups, right, and get those insights because if it if the names or the Chinese names are not well received, why are they not well received? What are the alternatives? How do we go back and uh, redo that? Right. Mm -hmm. So again, several challenges. Yeah, yeah, that, that that makes a lot of sense, especially uh, having to ask the uh, ask the locals uh, through focus group what they resonate with the end buyer. Yep. Yeah, that that mm. makes a lot of sense and saves a lot of money in the end as well. Absolutely. Um, mm. When working with international clients, what is one of the most important lessons that you personally have learned over the course of your marketing career? Um, working with those, let's stay on the Chinese topic. Yeah. You know, Chris, this is such a good question, and I thought a lot about how I'm going to answer this one. <laughs> um, I thought of, I thought of a few. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to like uh, answer it this way. If just in the case of like marketing in China, right? Like, if you want to enter a market like China and you want to succeed in China, leave your ego and politics at the door. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, and I say this from my own personal experience working with a global company. I'm not going to say who they are. Mm -hmm. um, and we were, I was part of a uh, five person marketing team that was mandated to conduct research on market opportunities and how the company can expand in China. And what we found out was that when they first entered the China market, they were the only player providing that particular product and solution. Fast forward 11 years later, they had 40 competitors. Wow. And they they pushed up one product a year, which was not nearly enough. Mm -hmm. And it didn't matter how much data, how much research, how many, I wouldn't say testimonials, but like proof we came with about why they needed to expand faster. Mm -hmm. The global team was just not convinced. Wow. And they said, well, we understand all of that. And thank you for your efforts. But we are going to invest more in our mature markets because the growth there was predictable. I'm like, OK. That might seem like a logical step. But if you are not willing to take risks in the developing markets like China and India, then you're going to lose out to the competition. And they did. Right? Yeah, it falls in line with the saying, what got you here won't get you there, right? Correct. Forward. And as well as what you said earlier about um, what you learned at university, that you cannot rest on your laurels and be, con you know, no. co content with uh, or, no. or satisfied with what 
what you, what you achieve, you always got to look forward and uh, progress and uh, advance. Absolutely not. And I think one of the things, just to, just to, to add one more point, that was always such a nerve wracking time, especially for the salespeople. And you probably know where I'm going with this because every SaaS person talks about it when it came to renewal. Mm -hmm. But one year later, when it came to contract renewal, and there was a hint from the client side that they might consider other vendors, then it was panic at the disco, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But then when that happens, my friend, it's already too late, yes. right? Because then you're in reactive mode. Yes, that's they, it. Yeah. yeah. What they should have been doing was nurturing that relationship and keeping that communication line open to see what can be improved. And when the client does provide feedback, act upon the feedback and not and not just say, okay, duly noted, we'll bring it up with our management and then crickets, right? Yeah, that's why, why there's a, a big um, increase in customer success teams in tech companies right now, actually. Absolutely. So that, that, that keeps them, you know, engaged, happy. And, uh, you know, if you only speak to your customer once a year when it comes to renewal time, that's not a way to build a yeah. relationship there. Yeah, exactly. And um, just one little lesson or takeaway, um, of something that I've learned over the years working with clients like Caterpillar, for example, mm -hmm. in China. it's And it's one thing that they appreciated. Be open and honest with your customer always. Mm -hmm. Even if it's something that they don't necessarily want to hear. right? Because I'm a firm believer in doing what is right for the customer in order for them to succeed, which, as you know, may not always be the same thing as what they asked you to do, right? Mm -hmm. They can be different things, right? That is true. That is, that is absolutely true. I, as we close the episode, what are uh, two books or podcasts you recommend anybody should read or listen to about marketing if they want to, you know, broaden their horizon and advance in their career? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say, I, I, I think, I would say books, like uh, Ogilvy and Advertising by the late, great Dave, David Ogilvy. So that's mm -hmm. on copywriting. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second book is uh, Building a Story Brand by Donald Miller. Mm -hmm. Right. Just heard about yeah. that this morning. Yeah, yeah. Really great book. I think I've read it twice now. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Ogilvy, and, definitely have to look into Ogilvy for sure for advertising. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and in like, terms of in, in terms of podcasts, I would say Marketing Tales by Chris Raposo. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And Marketers on a Mission by yes. you. Um, yeah. Great. Thanks so much. Um, one last thing. How can people get in touch with you to learn more about you or I'm Blake? Yeah. Well, first of all, thanks for thanks again for having me on your show, Chris. It was an absolute pleasure. And you can reach, uh, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. So my handle is uh, christian plep I'm Blake Consulting. Mm -hmm. And you can check out our website at www.imblake.co. So, oh, sorry, I should I should mention that too. I'm Blake is spelled E-I-N-B-L-I-C-K. Let's not assume that everybody knows how to spell that. And um, you can also tune into my podcast, uh, B2B Marketers on the Mission, wherever you get your favorite podcasts. And um, if you can, tune into the episode where I had a conversation with Chris Raposo. And uh, once again, shout out to Rob Conlon. Thank you so much, sir, for this connection. Rob's the best. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So I will definitely tag um, you in the in the summary as well as um, I'm Blake and your podcast. So yeah. everybody can find you there for sure. Sounds good. It was a pleasure talking to you today. We'll be in touch. Thank you so much for being part of the Marketing Tales show. Thanks, Chris.